Hey everyone, this is the second half of deployment for CloudBlock, and this video is specific to Azure deployments. Let's get started. We'll start from the GitHub project page and scroll up to Azure, and then scroll down past the step-by-step -step guide to the Azure specific installation instructions. We'll start with Windows Subsystem Linux in PowerShell. WSL and CD to our home directory. We need to install the Azure CLI. I'll copy and then right click to paste. I'm prompted for my sudo password. That's the password we just created in the previous video for Windows Subsystem Linux. This will take just a little bit. I'll be back when it's done. Okay, Azure CLI is installed. We can now run AZ login to authenticate. A browser window pops up. It asks me to pick my cloud account. After I logged in, I was automatically responded to in the CLI with success. It found my subscriptions. Let's continue. We can customize our deployment. We'll need to make sure we're in the Azure subdirectory of the CloudBlock project. And then we'll need to do the same thing, but in Windows File Explorer, grab the address. But take note, there's uh, the name Chad is in there, and I'll show you that. So in the address bar, you'll see the Chad. That's my Windows Subsystem Linux user. You'll need to replace it with yours. If you don't know your Windows Subsystem Linux user, you can type in who am I. So mine's already set to chat, I'll leave it alone. And then there's the az.tfrs file. That's the file that will hold our variables and some things that we need to customize. Double click it, it may prompt you to choose an application to open it in, Notepad is just fine. And if we scroll down to the variable section, we can see some of the variables that we must change. The very first one is ph password. That's the password you use to log into the pie hole. Make it something nice and secure. I'll make it simple for now change me one. We also need our SSH key. We did that in the last video. We can get the SSH key value by copy and pasting it in. There's the value. Grab it by highlighting. You don't need that last little bit. You can keep it if you want. Right click to copy to clipboard and then in between the quotes we'll delete the old and paste in ours. Management cider is next. That's the IP range that is granted web UI access to the pie hole, SSH access to the instance, and if DNS no VPN is set to one, which is the default, it's also granted DNS access without using the WireGuard VPN. If you're deploying from home, this should be your public IP address. That's fairly straightforward to get. I'll go to Google and type in what is my IP. There we go. Keep the slash 32 and replace the old with your IP address. A couple, those are all the things that we must change, but a couple other things that you should take a look at and at least be aware of. WireGuard peers, this next variable here, 20. This is the number of peer configurations or VPN configurations to generate. There's one per device. So if you have two phones and two laptops, make sure you would have at least four. The default is 20. There's no harm in having more than you need. And I believe the upper limit is somewhere around 250. So we'll leave that as is, 20 is fine for me. Next is the DNS over HTTPS provider. And if we look at the diagram, you can see that's this cloud over here. Eventually our DNS lookups need to go somewhere and you'll wanna choose a DOE provider, or DNS over HTTPS provider that works best for you. Open DNS is fine for me. I've had no problems, very reliable, but maybe do some research on the different providers and what they offer. Next is VPN traffic. Okay, so go back to the diagram. If we look at this, you'll notice Let's see if I can highlight it here, or at least point to it. You'll notice that our DNS lookups go through this service and then come back, but all of the actual internet browsing that our machines will do is done through the normal, a, a normal connection. 
that's by design. We don't generally want a ton of traffic going through the deployment we're going to create. We only really want our DNS traffic to go through. However, if you're interested, you could switch this from VPN underscore traffic equals DNS to all. And then all of your traffic would be routed through the VPN and your cloud instance out to the internet. Keep in mind, a lot of cloud services, cloud providers like Azure, AWS, Google Cloud, I believe all of them do charge um, and it can be significant for outbound traffic from the cloud. So if you use this with VPN traffic set to all and then you try to watch Netflix um, or you try to uh, upload files or transfer large amounts of data, um, that's going to incur costs, right? So keep that in mind. DNS traffic is fairly lightweight in, in comparison, and you won't be charged or you're, you're likely going to be within the free tier. Keep that in mind. Next, we have DNS no VPN equals one. That is the value referenced earlier. We keep it at one to allow our home network to talk to the pie hole directly. Okay, and then the Azure, some of the Azure specific stuff. For example, our region, I have it set to East US, that works fine for me, I'm in Florida. Maybe do a bit of research on which region is closest to you, and then the zone as well. I do have a command here you can run, and this will give you a list of the regions. Let's try it out. And there we go, there's a large list of regions available. You'll notice the vars file column, that's the, one, that's the value you want to put in your file, in the notepad file that we have open. And then you use the other value, so the other CLI, for the next variable. This is in regards to the version of Ubuntu that we deploy in the cloud, right? So we're running Ubuntu Linux in the cloud on our instance, and every so often, there's an update from Ubuntu in the Azure cloud, and this will let us know, and it doesn't happen too often, maybe once a month, and there's no real problem with using older versions. You just don't want to be too far out of date. But you can get the latest version of Ubuntu by running this command, replace location with the location in this right column. So I've got US East selected. I'm going to use East US, no spaces, in my command. So let's change it, east US. I'll grab the command and paste it in. And there's the latest version. I believe that matches what I've already got. It does. So I can leave that alone. And then a few more things to note. The free tier, um, so Azure has a 12 months free tier trial, at least at the time of this video, and we target that with these other variables, like the size of the disk and the size of the virtual machine itself. And then there are some very uncommon variables that you may or may not want to change. Um, I, none of them need to be changed by default, so I'm gonna keep them as they are. All right, that's all the variables. I'm gonna save this file, close it out, and we can go back down to our instructions. So we've edited the file and saved it we're ready to do our deployment. Make sure you're in the Azure subdirectory of the project. We are, but we can always do this to double check. And then we initialize Terraform. This will tell Terraform to download the Microsoft Azure specific code it needs and anything else that may need to be included with the project. Shouldn't take too long. And then we'll also run Terraform apply. We reference the variables file that we edited to customize our deployment. Terraform kind of does some magic here. It takes all the configuration files included in the project and that customize variables and determines a plan for all of the items that need to be built in the Azure cloud. We'll give this just a second to run. Okay, that was pretty quick. We can see there's a plan to add 34 separate resources. You can scroll up to see all the resources that it's going to create. I'm going to type in yes to perform the deployment. This will take a little while. This in, relies entirely on how quickly uh, Azure can build out the resources we need. Give it a few minutes. I'll be back when it's done. Okay, Terraform has completed the 
plan and it's been deployed in the cloud. We have some outputs here, but if we scroll over to our readme, we can see that we can wait for the virtual machine to become ready and Ansible will set up the services for us. We can connect if we want to watch Ansible set it up. So I'm mentioning Ansible here, Terraform is done. We now, if we look at the diagram, we can see this is Terraform plus Ansible. Terraform builds our cloud resources like our encryption, the virtual machine, our network and firewall rules, and then Ansible will configure the Ubuntu Linux uh, virtual machine that's running. It'll install the software it needs, the Docker containers, and we can watch that. So if I scroll back down, let's connect to the virtual machine via SSH. We can use this output from Terraform. The first time we log into the machine, it'll ask us if we want to continue. I'll say yes. And then we can tail the cloud block log file. This will eventually, and it may not be there yet, but this will eventually show us the output of Ansible as it runs through each configuration step. So I'll type this in. The file's not there yet, but that's okay. When the file appears, we'll start seeing output. I'll be back when it's done. Be patient, give it just a few minutes. It may take some time. One other thing worth mentioning, uh, so first I'm gonna control C to get out of tail. You can run HTOP, H-T-O-P. This is kind of a dashboard or overview of what your machine is doing in Linux. We can see that things are happening, the CPU is at 100%, our memory is in use, and there are commands. Let me see if I can zoom out a little bit there. Yeah, we can see that Ansible is being installed right now. We'll give that a little bit longer. Again, control C to get out. And then I'm gonna run tail again and I'll wait for the, uh, the output from Ansible. I'll be back. Okay, Ansible is done. We have a play recap and there are failed equals zero, no failures. We can exit with control C from the tail and then type in the word exit to log out of the instance. I'm gonna run Terraform apply one more time. This is just going to give me back about those outputs that I saw earlier that show me the URL for the pie hole and the URL for the WireGuard VPN configurations. Should just take a second. Okay, that was pretty quick. Well, let's take a look at the pie hole web UI. You can highlight and then right click to copy, open in a new tab. Your connection isn't private. That's only because we're using self-signed certificates. Our connection is still encrypted, that's okay. I'll continue. Let me turn off my dark reader and I'll log in with the password I set in the variables file. Mine was change me one. You can now edit your pile as needed. The one change that I wouldn't make or at least do some research on is under settings and then DNS. You'll see two IP addresses, those are the same IP address. That is our Cloudflare DNS over HTTPS container. That's transforming our DNS lookups that the PyHole runs into HTTPS to our DNS over HTTPS provider. You can kind of see that in the diagram here. That's this container, the IP address that we saw, and then that transforms the encrypted DNS lookups to our provider. All right. We can also look at our WireGuard configurations. I'll grab this URL, open a new tab. We see a WireGuard folder and all of the peer configurations. And there are 20 peer configurations here, one for each of the 20, that variable that we had set in our TFRs file. I'll go to one. And if we look at peer one, I download it, you'll see a it's a QR code. If I have the WireGuard app installed on my phone, uh, Android or iPhone, a tablet, um, you can use the app. So if I pulled up the WireGuard app, hit scan QR code, I can put my camera up to this QR and the configuration will automatically be set on my device. That way, if I ever turn the VPN on, if I open the WireGuard app and flip on the VPN connection, um, all my DNS lookups will go through the cloud services that we just set up. I'll get DNS-based ad blocking, and that's whether I'm at home on my own Wi-Fi or I'm in the public on my cellular provider or I'm on public Wi-Fi or something like that at a friend's house. Really nice. 
Uh, you'll need to do you'll need to do that for each one. There are other files. Oops. There are other configuration files in there. Those might be used for something like a laptop. See here, peer1.conf. Just make sure you use peer1 for say your cell phone, peer2 to say your laptop, three for your tablet, etc. Do one for each. Make sure that they don't overlap each other. That's about it. Um, you can use, because we have DNS underscore no VPN set to one, that was a default setting in our variables file, you could now also set your home router to point to this IP address for DNS lookups. Only It will only work for your home network. We've, the firewall rules are in place for that. Um, but you could do that if you don't want to have WireGuard installed across all of your devices. You could set your home network to use that for DNS. The last thing I'm going to do is destroy the project. Let's say you're done. You no longer need the service or you've switched to a different cloud provider or maybe even a different account. Uh, you can easily delete or destroy everything by running Terraform Destroy instead of Terraform Apply. Terraform will go through all of the resources that it has created and then it'll ask you, are you sure you want to destroy? I'll say yes and Terraform will happily delete everything that it has created. That's about it everyone. Have a great day.